If that's true, if the US had sensors inside of Syria that could detect chemical weapons use, um, I don't understand why they wouldn't make a more definitive statement. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 21 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. This program is mostly about Syria. We begin with an anti-war rally in Hartford, Connecticut, sponsored by a score of peace and progressive organizations. Then some comments by investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill, given at a prestigious lecture at Yale University. We end with video from a dissident Israeli soldier given at the Tree of Life. for 10, 13, and more years. Half a million or more children killed. Shock and awe. And there was no weapons of mass destruction. All those intelligence agencies, NSA, CIA, and a million other acronyms couldn't get it right. We know they didn't want to get it right. But here, we're supposed to trust them again. Obama and the White House issued an assessment last week, four pages with no evidence at all, just claims of evidence. And then we heard yesterday Congressman Grayson on TV, on Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! show, said Congress didn't see any evidence either. They saw 12 pages with claims of evidence. He wants to hear this supposed conversation by the Syrian officers, and he hasn't been able to hear it. Well, I want to hear it too. It shouldn't be a national secret. We want to know what went on. And if something terrible went on, and if it wasn't an accident, perhaps the rebels dropped something they had, if it was something terrible that Assad's government did, fine, let the world know about it, and let the real international community take action, not the U.S., France, and Denmark. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Jan Carlson Bull, minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Meriden, Connecticut, not so far from here. Some of us remember the mistake that was Vietnam. It was a mistake that didn't simply cost 50,000 American lives and more than that number of suicides. It cost millions of lives of our neighbors in Southeast Asia. Some of us remember the mistake that was the Gulf War. More of us remember the mistake that was the Iraq War. 
We don't want to remember the horrible mistake that could be the war on Syria. We don't want to remember that. We can prevent it. I okay, I represent American Muslim Peace Initiative. I'm Atif Qureshi. I'm the executive director. American Muslim Peace Initiative. So I have a brief statement. We stand with all of you today to express our disagreement with Obama administration's insist insistence on military action in Syria. There can be no disagreement, however, when it comes to recognizing the tragic humanitarian crisis that has been unfolding in Syria for more than two years and finding ways to end the human suffering. That is the real cost of war. Debating over which side to pick in the Syrian civil war and neglecting the influx of refugees that is threatening the economic stability of regions surrounding Syria is a mistake. I've got something to say. Uh, this isn't going, the U.S. going to war against Syria, in Syria, isn't just about Syria. It's the same story we've seen over and over and over again in all these different countries. It's about money. It's about money for defense contractors like Boeing and Lockheed Martin, the people who will make the missiles that they'll, they'll shoot down on Syria. And I think, uh, like my friend Vic was saying earlier, there's a connection here that we've got the same problem going on in all different aspects of our lives. It's, it's not just this war. It's everything that the government touches. It's capitalism. That is the reason for this war. And it's the reason that the oil industry is so out of... This is the time to ask for helping the people who are suffering. This is the time to stand up for the people who are suffering, but not to kill others. And there is no such thing as a smart bomb. When a child dies, the father, the mother do not differentiate whether they died from a, a chemical or a bullet or a bomb. It hurts the same. How can we say that? That it's one thing is wrong it doesn't make another thing better. Two wrongs do not make it right. So we need to get the message out to everyone that we are humanitarian. In this humanitarian crisis, we are all united to help the people. We'll drop gas masks, not bombs. Grass masks, not bombs. Gas masks, not bombs. Gas masks, not bombs. Gas masks, not bombs. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to take up that much more time, but I just want to say it is inspiring to see so many people out here today, young, old, all kinds of people. And there are people out doing this right now in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in Boston, in Philadelphia, in, all over the country, and all over the world. They're in mass protests in, in London and in other parts of the UK. And that is part of the reason that Parliament there had to vote no to authorizing a war on Syria. We know that a people's movement can have an effect. There's a lot of illusions even here, that our government will listen to us if we say no. This is the same imperialist government that has been oppressing the working peoples of the world from the time they divided up the entire world into the superpowers. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. So we need to take the power into the working class. We are the change we need to see right now. We cannot constantly go to the voting booth and hope that Obama or someone else will listen to us. It's proved not to work. The, the current example, they say the chemical weapons were used and that it was urgent because of that. But I, I seem to remember that only if not very long before that, that the Egyptian military mowed down over a thousand people on the streets of Egypt in a variety of places, not just Cairo, but in a number of smaller towns as well. Now I have to ask myself the question, if they can go and talk about the horrors of Syria and say that we need to intervene immediately, 
Why aren't they saying, what about the horrors of Egypt? If we stop the U.S. from carrying out this bombing and this murder, it will signal the people around the world that yes, if they want freedom, they have a chance in hell of doing it without the U.S. coming in and killing them all, as they have seen so many times before. That's what we are here doing today. It is very easy at this moment when, when uprisings around the Middle East and around the world are stumbling to become demoralized and to lose confidence and lose hope and become so demoralized that you look for any ally even the murderer who just killed your niece and your cousin and your brother and your mother. At all costs, we must avoid that kind of demoralization because as bad as things are now, they can get worse. And with the U.S. involved, they most certainly will. Even if the U.S. were to get involved in something like, say, peace negotiations, when the U.S. gets involved in peace negotiations, it uses the carrot and the stick. It extracts concessions from people. We must put our faith in the working and oppressed people of the world. The people in Syria, the people in Egypt, and so on and so forth. Even if they fail today, even if they are crushed today, we must maintain the confidence that in the long term, they and we can win. Thank you. I really want to thank you for being here today and ask you again to take the time to pick up the phone. According to Larson's office, 162 people contacted him in the last week about this. I was 163. So, uh, and I asked how many of those people wanted him to vote no, and he said, well, that, we can't really tell you. So I said, is that classified? <laughs> so, you know, we live in a classified state, you know? You can't even find out how many, but you can bet uh, your bottom dollar that out of that 163, about 160 of them said no, because that's been the pattern across the country. So this time, we have the people with us. No more war! 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 Jeremy Scahill has written the important books Blackwater and Dirty Wars. He was one of the winners of Yale's Wyndham Campbell Prize this year, and he gave talks at the university on September 12th. In one of them, he was asked... No, we shouldn't bomb Syria. I mean, the U.S. should not bomb Syria. But, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fast-forwarding past a long explanation which would end with, no, we should not bomb Syria. Um, I mean, first of all, let's be clear, the U.S. has already been intervening in Syria for some time, as has Iran, as has Hezbollah, uh, as has Qatar, as has Turkey. I mean, there already is a proxy war. Uh, it, there's a civil war in Syria that has become a proxy war of, of, of Russia, of course, deeply involved in supporting the Assad regime. Um, I mean, I think Bashar, Bashar al-Assad is a war criminal who should be prosecuted for the crimes that he's committed against his own people. I'm, uh, you know, that's abundantly clear to anyone with eyes to see. Uh, to me, that's the boring part of the discussion. You know that. He's a butcher. Clear. Saddam was a butcher. Milosevic was a butcher. All, all, all of that is abundantly clear. The issue here is that the United States refuses to recognize in the International Criminal Court as having jurisdiction over 
it, it, it's its own operations and its allies' operations. So when we're calling for selective prosecution of certain kinds of war criminals, but 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 uh, uh, writing away with excuses the crimes of the powerful of the world, it undermines any sense of moral legitimacy or credibility. When the when the when the United Nations is doing the bidding or the will of the U.S., it's a legitimate institution. When it is a, uh, in, in the General Assembly opposing the U.S., it becomes a uh, a debate society that only should just be used for consultations and nothing binding. So, so, so to me, the you know the, the principle here is that we're looking at another uh, case where the cruise missile liberals, the Samantha Power, Richard Holbrook School of Foreign Policy, are agitating for another war that has much more to do with America needing to preserve its sense of legitimacy in the world than it has to do with an actual humanitarian uh, motivation. My own question to Scahill had to do with the fact that the corporate media is not asking to see the actual evidence that the White House says it has tying the Assad regime to the chemical attacks in Syria. I asked him if it was odd that the media was merely satisfied with White House claims that it had the evidence. You know, I, I was talking to some students earlier today, and I was, I was saying that there was this really fascinating report in the Washington Post a week or so ago. Barton Gellman uh, has access to a tiny fraction of the Snowden documents. Uh, and he, he did a report about the, uh, the black budget, as they call it, the, um, the classified congressional funding, uh, the, the budget uh, for the intelligence community, and buried in the very, at the very end of his piece was a paragraph where he said that the United States had sensors in, inside of Syria that could detect chemical weapons use. And I, I read the entire, uh, I had access to the entire top secret classified black budget um, because of a project that I'm working on right now and I saw that in there as well. If that's true, if the US had sensors inside of Syria that could detect chemical weapons use, um, I don't understand why they wouldn't make a more definitive statement saying that we have you know, evidence directly that Syria, uh, that the Syrian regime used chemical weapons or even that chemical weapons were used. They, uh, they're, they're, they're citing other nations' intelligence. Um, and I, I believe the other nations that they're citing are, are, are almost certainly Saudi Arabia and, and Israel. And as I said earlier, I, I, I think it's plausible that, that Assad did use chemical weapons. I think it's also plausible that some elements of the Syrian uh, military that had defected. The rebels may have uh, brought the delivery vehicles for those, but I, I, I don't know. I do think, though, that um, it does a disservice to this debate if the administration is not forced to or asked to provide actual concrete evidence of, to, to, to back up its, uh, its claims. You know. Much more of Scahill's remarks on a future program and on our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Now, the one country whose government and population supports U.S. bombing of Syria is Israel. And there are many reports that its lobby in the United States is pushing full throttle ahead for war. Its best-known branch, AIPAC, sent 300 lobbyists into the halls of Congress to support the bombing. On the other hand, with a couple days' work, we at the struggle were able to get over a hundred Jews from around the world to sign up on a statement denouncing AIPAC's efforts and opposing the bombing of Libya. See the statement and the names of the signers on our website, thestruggle.org. On Saturday, October 12th in the New Haven Library, There'll be a presentation by Breaking the Silence. That's a group of dissident Israeli soldiers who are sick at heart over the things they're ordered to do and want the world to hear about it. We bring you now one member of the group, Iran Efrati, who spoke some time ago at a past Tree of Life conference. My name is Iran Efrati and I'm 27 years old and I'm a seventh generation. In Jerusalem, my grandpa was actually uh, a Palestinian Jew growing up at the old city, growing up with a Palestinian family that raised him and adopted him after his mother died when he, when he came to the world. 
I grew up with the notion that my grandpa is a hero. My grandpa grew up to join the Irgun, the Lehi. He was an Israeli freedom fighter, if you want, against the British colonialism. I grew up on the nation that he is probably one of the most bravest people I know. And I will definitely want to be someone like him who's fighting for freedom and human rights of people everywhere. But he grew up and my family grew up with him, and they grew up very differently than what I imagined as a young boy in Jerusalem. From my other side of the family, from my mother's side, my grandpa and grandma came from Hungary after the Holocaust. They were both the survivors. My grandma was a survivor of Auschwitz. I grew up with my grandma and were very close to her for all of my life. All through my childhood, I remembered my grandma waking up in the middle of the night, screaming, going around it in the house. My mother used to tell me she still have dreams about people coming to take her, people coming to kill her, which was of course very obvious to me. I grew up with the notion, with the notion that the Holocaust is only one thing and it can only happen to Jewish people. I grew up in a very Zionist house like I think most of the Israelis are. My brother was an officer in a special unit of the parachutes in Israel. My mother was an officer in the army. My father was an officer in the army and until today is the head of investigation in the Israeli police. I grew up with the notion that Zionism is just making sure there will be no other Holocaust, to making sure that Jews can just live with everybody else. I grew up with the notion that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. I grew up with the notion that if you do not believe in a state only for Jewish people, you maybe support the killing of Jewish people. I, didn't, I don't fight on human rights and I didn't fight for the right to freedom of people. I'm doing the exact opposite. From that point on, everything seems so crazy. I did everything. I did the checkpoints. I did the checking in the houses. I did the arrest. Everyone with kids and grown-ups and elderly people. And I did it like a machine because something just shut up inside of me. The idea of, of just leaving the army was never an option when I grew up. The idea of leaving the army was crazy. It was crazier than death, just leaving. I knew I would not have a home to come back to, so I finished my service. And the day I finished my service, I swear that this is what I was going to do with my life. I swear that I'm going to tell these stories to as many people as I can. I joined immediately the same day a group called Breaking the Silence. Breaking the Silence is a group that collects testimonies from soldiers all over the West Bank and Gaza. I was the main investigator for two and a half years. I collect the testimonies for the Gaza massacre in 2009, and the booklet of Hebron and other booklets that came out from Breaking the Silence. But in some point I also understand, and can I steal some of your time? So I'm stealing some of your time. Thank you. In some point I understand that the NGOs in Israel, the NGO I worked with, and I worked with a lot of NGOs around me, got a glass ceiling in them. In some point, the Israeli NGOs are very busy talking with the Israeli public and with the Jewish public. One of the things that happened to me on and on on my service is doing something, doing this crazy thing, arresting 20 kids just to bring the message for a village that, that a nonviolent protest will not happen in our watch. And coming back home, and hearing that my unit, from the news, from the radio, from the TV, hearing that my unit stopped 20 terrorists around the weekend in Palestine. Very shortly, it took me to understand that we are being lied to. And the idea of just keeping trying to talk with the Israeli public, hoping they will change their mind, it's hopeless not only because there's so many interests, political and finance, in invested in this occupation but also that the brainwashing 
and the education we grew up on and the cynical use of the Holocaust over and over again was so deep in me, in my friend, in my family. My mother lied to me, my father lied to me. And I decided I want to stop lying to people. And one of the things we believed in is that if we don't want to lie anymore, we need to say that all the peace process is not going anywhere. And the Israelis will not let go of their control willingly, with no pressure. And the only way we see effective today changes something in Palestine, in Israel, and for the Middle East, and for us as Jews in Israel, is the pressure of joining the call from 2005 of the Palestinian people for boycott, divestment, and sanction in Israel. So we want to invite you to go home, check for the website of Breaking the Silence, the website of Anarchist Against the Wall that we were both in, and most important, the website of the BDS movement and the boycott from within and trying to help us Stop the occupation. Thank you very much. Tree of Life will be holding many conferences this year starting October 13th. To see the whole schedule and the speakers, go to tolef.org. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. When the world has gone crazy and it's all becoming clear when they're gunning down our comrades and it seems the end is near as they're loading up the launchers for the tear gas grenades we can take off our bandanas and kiss behind the barricades when it's madness all around and you can see this at a glance we will sing